thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation. I, I've been following this seminar uh, since uh, the beginning and, uh, well, I cannot always uh, be at the same time, but watching the recorded lectures, have, have, it's a great possibility. Uh, okay, so today I will talk about joint work with uh, Sebastián Herrero and Juan Rivera Letelier. Um, and the title is uh, Distribution of CM Points, but Piadic one. Uh, so let me start uh, with the complex case, just to, to have the motivation for this work. So uh, <clears throat> I will denote Y of C, the moduli space of uh, elliptic curves over complex numbers up to complex uh, isomorphism. And as it is well known, this can be uniformized by the upper half plane. It's a quotient H over SL two Z. Uh, now uh, we pick a discriminant. So by definition, a, a negative integer, which is either zero or one mod four. And this uh, integer determines a unique order of discriminant D inside the, the, the quadratic field Q square root of D. Um, so the main, um, the main actors today will be the elements in the set uh, co called HD, which is the set of complex elliptic curves uh, with endomorphism ring isomorphic to OD. So this uh, HD is a finite set. Uh, the number of elements can be, well, it's a set that can be put into a one-to-one -one correspondence with the Picard group of the order. So this is the very classical CM theory. And uh, in this talk, a CM point will be an element of HD for some D. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the basic theorem is a theorem uh, proved first by Duke and then extended to full generality by, generality by Closel and Ulmo, uh, stating that the sets uh, HD equidistribute on this uh, complex modular curve as D goes to minus infinity according to the hyperbolic measure. So uh, more concretely, this means that uh, for any test function, <clears throat> say continuous and compactly support, uh, when you take the average, when you average the, the function on the set HD, so you evaluate at every point in HD and divide by the number of elements, then uh, as D goes to minus infinity, this will converge to the integral of F according to this uh, measure, which is uh, dx dy over y squared, which is the hyperbolic measure on the upper half plane. And there is this uh, constant uh, three over pi to account for the fact that uh, you will have a probability measure uh, in the limit because all of these uh, measures are probability measures. Okay, so Duke proved this theorem for in the particular case where the sequence of discriminants is a sequence of, of fundamental discriminants. And then Closen and Ulmo extended this for arbitrary discriminants. <clears throat> so in this talk, we will look at the piadic situation. So we fix a uh, prime number P. Uh, we will denote by uh, CP the complete completion of uh, the algebraic closure of QP bar. So uh, CP is by definition a complete and algebraically closed field. Uh, throughout the talk, we will fix an embedding of Q bar inside uh, CP. And uh, once we do that, uh, we can think of the elements of HD since uh, we know they are actually defined over number fields. So we can think of them as uh, elliptic curves uh, defined uh, over Q bar. So you can take the Weistrass equations with algebraic uh, coefficients. And uh, using the embedding, you can see this as a subset of the piadic points of the modular curve. So I haven't defined Y of CP, but uh, it's by definition the set of uh, CP elliptic curves up to isomorphism, CP isomorphism. So now you have uh, these uh, CM points, they, they, you can see them uh, also as uh, points inside the Biadic space. Uh, 
So the main question we want to address today is that um, if you take a sequence of discriminants uh, going to minus infinity, so how are the sets HDN distributed inside this uh, periodic modular curve as M goes to infinity? And uh, I will explain during the talk that, that um, the answer really depends on the sequence of discriminants you consider. So you see in the, I will come back to the complex case. In this theorem, there is no sequence and it's for any discriminant going to minus infinity. But in the periodic situation, uh, there, will, there is a difference and uh, you have to classify somehow sequences in order to state uh, an equidistribution theorem. So, okay, so I will start, there will be, there will be a few cases. So I will start with the, what we call the transient case. I will explain what I mean by transient. So definition, uh, the distribution of the sets HDN is transient if uh, for every point in the periodic uh, modular curve, there is a neighborhood uh, U such that the proportion of uh, CM points uh, landing on U tends to zero as N goes to infinity. Yeah, so transient distribution means that these points are, are not concentrated in any way. Uh, okay, so the first theorem will characterize the sequences giving rise to a transient distribution. And for that, I need to introduce a, a definition, another definition. Uh, if you take any point inside uh, HD, then uh, we know that it has a potential good reduction. So call it E tilde the reduction, analytic curve over FP bar. And this reduction can be uh, ordinary or super singular. So we will define this symbol, the Periodic uh, p super singular uh, valuation uh, of d. This will be by definition infinity if the reduction is uh, ordinary, and uh, if it's super singular, then it will be the periodic uh, valuation, the periodic order of of d. So the exponent of p inside d. Okay. So <clears throat> the transient theorem <clears throat> tells you that uh, the distribution of the sets HDN uh, is transient if and only if uh, the limit when n goes to infinity of this uh, p super singular uh, evaluation uh, at the n is uh, goes to infinity or is infinity. So you see this uh, limit condition uh, will be satisfied by definition if you take a sequence such that all reductions are ordinary because we define this symbol to be plus infinity. So, okay. so you will have this condition. So it's telling you that uh, when, when the reduction is always ordinary, uh, CM points are not concentrating anywhere. The distribution is transient. The other possibility is that uh, the reduction is super singular, but the, the exponent of P uh, inside the N goes to infinity. Okay, so that's uh, our first case. <clears throat> Now uh, I will explain what happens in the other cases. So, so what are the other cases? So we will concentrate on the non-transient situation. So that means that uh, we will assume from now on that every elliptic curve in HDN has super singular reduction. And also that uh, the periodic valuation of the N remains bounded as N varies because otherwise we know that there's transient distribution. So we don't want that, so we assume it's bounded. Uh, a first remark uh, is that uh, the fact that this reduction is super singular can be read uh, inside the, the order, the ODN. And um, <clears throat> it's equivalent to say that uh, the completion of P of uh, ODN is an order in a quadratic extension of QP. Uh, the other, well, since we are assuming that the periodic valuation is bounded, we will fix it. Yeah. We will fix the periodic valuation, so we'll assume it is fixed. And remark that uh, that can also be read uh, in terms of the order, 
because uh, the evaluation is fixed if and only if the quadratic order you obtain by completion is fixed. This quadratic order only depends on the PID evaluation of the end. So if we fix this PID evaluation, we fix the order. So with that in mind, uh, it makes sense to uh, fix, we fix uh, an order in a quadratic extension of QP and look at uh, all elliptic curves uh, such that the completion at P of the endomorphism ring is isomorphic to this O we fixed. And moreover, we will take the periodic closure of this set. Okay, so that will be what we call lambda O. So if, this, uh, if these elliptic curves are going to equidistribute, uh, the, the limit measure will have to be support on this set lambda O. Yeah, so any possible limit measure must be supported on, on this set. If we go along a sequence, the end, uh, such that the completion is O. Uh, okay. So with that in mind, <clears throat> the, um, the theorem, the super singular situation is the following. Uh, first of all, this uh, the closure of this uh, of this set uh, of CM points is a compact set. That's our first point. Uh, a second point is that uh, if you take two different orders, so you have two different sets lambda, the, then they are actually disjoint. Yeah, so these uh, orders, they somehow uh, they are. Um, yeah, they, they sit inside the modular curve, but they don't do not touch each other. So you have compact sets which are disjoints. Okay, now uh, to, in order to state the distribution theorem, I will make an assumption which is not really necessary, it's just for simplicity. So assume P is one mod four. Uh, under this assumption, uh, we can show that there exists a measure called uh, new O. Uh, with support equal to this lambda O, uh, such that uh, when you run HDNs, uh, where the completion of ODN at P is fixed, isomorphic to O, then the sequence of sets equidistributes as uh, the discriminant goes to minus infinity with respect to this measure, measure uh, new O. <clears throat> okay, so that's the situation uh, and as I said that uh, if P is two or P is three mod four, uh, there, is, there is also a, a, an equidistribution theorem, but it is likely more complicated to state. So <clears throat> in this talk, I will stick to, to the case one mod four just for simplicity. But uh, okay, but you can also write down an equidistribution statement. Okay. Um, so this is our main um, theorem, I will say. Uh, so now, okay, this is <clears throat> fine, but I would like to uh, show uh, an application, a Diophantine application of, uh, of this result. So um, let me, for, for that, let me remind you that uh, the J invariant of a CM elliptic curve is usually called a singular modulus. And these are well known to be algebraic integers. They play a very important role in Hilbert's 12th problem. Um, so what, what we can prove is the following. Uh, fix a finite set uh, S of prime numbers and a singular modulus uh, J0. Then uh, the set of singular modulus uh, J such that uh, j minus j0 is an S unit. Uh, this is a finite set. So the statement is that this set displayed here is finite. Uh, just a reminder, so to be an S unit, that means that, uh, well, these are algebraic integers. So when you take the absolute norm, you get a, an integer, a rational integer. Uh, to be an S unit means that the prime factors, they are all inside P. So if, if you constrain the prime factors to belong to a fixed set, then you only get finitely many differences of singular moduli. Uh, 
Well, this statement has a bit of a, a, bit of a history, so I will explain. Um, for us, the starting point was the theorem of Philip Habege. Uh, he treated the situation when the set S is empty. So be, being an empty unit means to be an algebraic unit. Okay. So an algebraic integer such that the inverse is also an algebraic integer. So uh, he proved that uh, the set of uh, singular moduli, which are algebraic units, units is finite. And uh, his method uh, used the complex execution of CM points. So what we do essentially is to take uh, Philip's method and uh, inject our uh, periodic results to extend this uh, statement for S units. Um, well, uh, this, this first result of Habegger and also our result is non-effective. We don't give any estimate on the number of elements of the set, nor uh, on their height. Uh, but there are a number of effective results. Uh, so Bilou, uh, Habegger and Kune, they proved that um, the set of algebraic units is actually, singular moduli which are algebraic units is actually empty. Yeah, so not only finite, but uh, empty. And the same if you plug here uh, 1728 in, instead of zero. Uh, later, Yin Kung Li, he proved that uh, in full generality for every CM, for every singular modulus J0, uh, this set is empty. So uh, that means that uh, for any pair of singular moduli, the difference uh, is, al is always divisible by some prime number. And there is also a result by Campagna that um, he shows that uh, the set uh, of S units uh, uh, related to, to zero, so the set of singular moduli which are S units is empty when S is what I call S ordinary, which is the, the set of primes of ordinary reduction for the elliptic curve with J invariant equal to zero. So this is an infinite set, but uh, only concerns uh, ordinary reduction points. And he has a similar result for 1728. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but, um, well, this is uh, what we had, but uh, at some point, Philip, he uh, asked about uh, other hub module. What uh, can you say about uh, uh, only oh okay so uh, small correction so uh, this uh, Billy Billu Habegger and Cuny they did not prove they did not prove that this set is empty but uh, it follows from Lee's work yeah. sorry about that okay so let me continue so uh, we can we realize after some uh, after some um, emails uh, exchange with Philip that we can uh, generalize uh, a bit our statement <clears throat> uh, in, in this form. So, um, so take F to be a half module for a genus zero subgroup of uh, GL2 plus of Q. Uh, so by definition, a half module is, a, is an element generating the function field of a modular curve of genus zero. Uh, assume that uh, this function f and the j invariant are algebraically dependent over q bar. Yeah, so this is a sort of uh, arithmetic normalization of f. Now uh, the same result follows. So if you take, uh, if you let s to be a finite set of prime numbers, and if you fix uh, an element in the upper half plane tau zero which is a quadratic imaginary algebraic number, then uh, the set of uh, say CM values, so F evaluated at tau, where tau is quadratic imaginary, and such that the difference F of tau minus F of tau zero is an S unit, this set is always finite. <clears throat> um, okay, so, um, 
some examples, well, an example is uh, what uh, I already showed, the, the case of the J invariance, so take F, F equal to J, so that's the previous theorem. But this also applies to the so-called lambda invariance, so, which is a hub module for a, for a modular curve of level two. It also applies to Weber functions, which are hub modules for, <clears throat> uh, well, a group which is a bit difficult to describe, but it's, um, it's a classical function used in the CM theory to generate class fields. And another interesting example is, uh, well, a, a family of interesting examples is uh, this, what's well, the so-called Mike Thompson series uh, attached to elements of the monster group. Yeah, so the monster group, uh, the theory, the representation theory of the monster group is also a, a source of interesting hub models. And this theorem applies to them. <clears throat> okay, so these are the, the results uh, I wanted to uh, explain. <clears throat> um, and now <clears throat> I will um, explain the main ideas uh, behind um, behind um, this, uh, this theorem of equidistribution of, uh, in the super singular locus. Yeah, so I will explain how, how we prove this theorem. Okay, so uh, the first uh, remark is that um, once you fix P, there are, there are only, only finitely many uh, super singular elliptic curves over FP bar. Let's call them E1 up to EK. Um, the number K can be computed in terms of P, that's very classically known, but here we will not use it. Um, let's call uh, DEJ will be the set of uh, periodic elliptic curves uh, such that the reduction mod P is isomorphic to, I, to EG. So uh, this is a disk, it's a residue disk, with a set of points reducing to some element uh, over a finite field. So the mental picture is that you have uh, at the bottom all these uh, finitely many super singular elliptic curve and above uh, every one of them, you have a disk, which uh, when you perform reduction mod P uh, entirely uh, collapses to the elliptic curve. So uh, what we will do is to fix one of these uh, super singular elliptic curves and seek to understand the asymptotic distribution of the sets HDN uh, landing inside the disk corresponding to E. Yeah, so, uh, okay, so these uh, CM points will be somehow distributed in the super singular locus and we will see what happens uh, at the level of uh, one disk, so say that one. <clears throat> okay, so for now we, we fix one super singular uh, elliptic curve, and uh, yeah, I will um, also um, in, in <clears throat> I will also assume some simplifying hypotheses, uh, which are not uh, really necessary, but in order to explain uh, the main ideas uh, in a simpler way, I will. Uh, I will simplify a bit the, the settings. So, uh, okay. First of all, uh, as as uh, as we are in the super singular case, we will assume that all elements in HDN have super singular reduction. So that's our first uh, thing. Uh, we fix an order inside a quadratic extension of QP and an elliptic curve, super singular elliptic curve E. So. Uh, we will assume that uh, O is a maximal order, which is more or less like if we were in the complex situation, it's like uh, assuming that we, we are dealing with fundamental discriminants. And we will actually assume that as well. We will assume that the N is a fundamental discriminant for all N, like in Duke's uh, theorem. Also, we will suppose that uh, the N is not divisible by P. Uh, well, P equal one mod four because um, that's the statement I gave. And uh, 
Another simplifying hypothesis is that the super single elliptic curve we fixed has known and trivial automorphism. So uh, we'll, this hypothesis will tell you that uh, the n is not a square uh, mod, uh, mod p, so uh, p is uh, inert in the quadratic field uh, q as square root of the n. And uh, the completion of P of this uh, ODN are uh, equal to the maximal order of the unique non-ramified ex quadratic extension of QP. Okay. You have, when P is at least three, you have only uh, three quadratic extension of QP. One of them is non-ramified. So this is, we are, we are working on, on that uh, case. <clears throat> Okay, uh, now I will, before I read all this slide, I will tell you the goal. The goal is to, uh, is to uniformize the set lambda O, which I, let's remember lambda O is just the closure of all CM elliptic curves, such that the completion at P of the endomorphism ring is O. So um, we need a, we need some, um, description of this space uh, that will allow allow us to prove a distribution we will, what we will do is to uniformize this space by uh, some quaternion algebra so i will explain that so uh, okay so we start with a local division quaternion algebra so the d quaternion algebra over qp which is a division algebra uh, call ob the maximal order which is there is a unique maximal order uh, this uh, algebra is relevant because the completion of, at P of the endomorphism ring of E is uh, isomorphic to OB. And uh, using that uh, and the deformation theory of the formal group attached to E, uh, endows the E with an action of the units inside OB. Okay, so this is where we are using the simplifying hypothesis that uh, E has no uh, non trivial automorphism. Okay, now uh, fix a uh, discriminant of inside O. Yeah, so a small remark, since, since O is a periodic order, the, there's no a unique discriminant. You, you have many discriminants. So fix, fix one, which is by definition, you take a basis and then uh, you, you change the basis by the Galois action and you, you take the determinant of a, two, of a two by two matrix and you get a, num a periodic number. That's one determinant, but it's not unique. It's unique up to a square. Uh, okay, so you fix one uh, or choose one and uh, we will uh, define uh, the set SL, which is by definition the set the set of elements in the order, in the maximal order, having trace zero and a reduced norm equal to minus L. So uh, this is a subset of OB star because since the norm is uh, minus L and L is not divisible by P, well, it didn't say it, but L is not divisible by P because it is a discriminant and we are in the unramified case. So. That's why discriminants are not divisible by P. Okay, so these are units, in particular, the elements of SL act on the disk uh, DE. Okay, so the uniformization we, uh, we use for the set lambda O is the following. We show that uh, for every element in SL, every element in SL acts with a unique fixed point and uh, such fixed point, uh, well, will be an element of lambda O. And moreover, the map uh, going from SL to lambda O that to any, to any element uh, attaches the fixed point uh, is a, well, continuous bijection if we mod out SL by plus or minus one. So, uh, this, uh, we will think of this map as a uniformization of lambda O. So when you try to predict the distribution, it is useful to, to, to that your space is a homogeneous space. But uh, it turns out the, 
the super similar locus of the modular curve is not really a homogeneous space. But one, what you can, what we show here is that this lambda O they are, and this is how we will, and and we will exploit that to to prove a equidistribution. Um, okay, so uh, okay, so still at the philosophical level. So we, we want to prove something here. We will construct a measure on the left hand side on S L. Uh, and we have to somehow um, de describe uh, the CM points in lambda O in terms of points in SL. So we will do, so now we'll explain two things. One, uh, how to construct measures on SL and two, how to read uh, CM points inside uh, SL. So let's start with the measure. So. Um, well, this set is a compact set, and uh, sorry, and uh, it is uh, invariant under conjugation by B star, yeah? because conjugation by B star will not affect the trace nor the norm. So this set uh, has an action by B star by conjugation. So by definition, uh, we will denote by mu L the uniform measure S L, which is the unique probability measure on SL, which is invariant under this action by conjugation. Now, <clears throat> this uh, perfectly defines a measure on SL, but it can be written down more concretely. Uh, let me explain that. So a fixed uh, an integer R, bigger or equal to one, and uh, take a reduction map from the set of quaternions with trace zero to uh, z over p to the r z uh, cubed. Yeah, because the um, OB is a, is a z, zp mold, module uh, of, uh, of rank four. But if you uh, impose the trace to be zero, the rank drops by one. So you have a rank three zp module. Uh, and so, by choosing an integral basis, you can uh, you can uh, uh, construct a reduction map to the set uh, to the right. <clears throat> okay, there is uh, so fix one reduction map. Then um, now, uh, if you um, if you run uh, through the elements of z over p to the r z cubed and look at the inverse image, uh, these sets will cover the, the SL, this periodic sphere. So uh, let's call uh, M sub R, yeah, MR will be the number of uh, non-empty sets that are covering this, uh, this sphere. Okay, so with all this in mind, so if you take, uh, any one of these sets. So the uniform measure will be really uniform. So it will attach to this set, the measure, which is one over the total number of such sets. So in other words, it's like uh, uh, you fix an element uh, or you look at the set of elements in SL, which reduce to the same point that will give you a set. Uh, uh, this set, if you move it by conjugation, will cover all of the cell. And since you want your measure to be invariant, then you can do no other thing, but uh, you need, you really have that mu uh, L of this set has to be uh, one over MR. MR. Okay, so th this, that's why this is a uniform measure. Okay. Um, now uh, I have to explain to you how you read CM points on SL, on the periodic board. So for that, uh, let me introduce uh, this set, which I will call VD. Here, this little d, has, uh, you have to think of it as a discriminant, a fundamental discriminant. So VD will be by definition, the set uh, of endomorphism of E of the elliptic curve. There's no completion here, that's, uh, that's important. So 
the set of endomorphism of E, it's an order in a global Quetiron algebra. So this is a Z module of rank four. So you take all the elements there with trace zero and norm equal to minus D. Uh, again, uh, this set can be seen inside, uh, can be sent to OB star by completion. If you complete at P, then, uh, well, if you assume at least that P does not divide the discriminant, you, you get um, an invertible element in, in the local quaternion algebra. Okay, so what we show is the following, is that uh, if you take a fundamental discriminant with such that P does not divide D, and also it's not a square mod P, so this is telling you that the reduction of the corresponding elliptic curves is very singular, then uh, every G uh, inside the set VD has a unique fixed point in the E. And moreover, uh, the set of uh, CM elliptic curves with discriminant D landing on the disk DE can, is just the union over all VD of the fixed points of G. So this is how you can read uh, in the quaternion algebra the CM points. So they will be there, there. They will be fixed points of some special elements that come from a global quaternion algebra. Okay. So now we have all the uh, all the tools. So I will explain how the argument runs. Uh, okay, so we take a sequence dn of uh, fundamental discriminants with p does not divide dn, and such that dn is not a square mod p, so super similar reduction. Uh, for every discriminant, we will consider uh, the set vdn, so global endomorphisms with trace zero and norm dn minus dn. Um, that now we know they parameterize uh, CM points. And uh, remember that, uh, as I said uh, before, that uh, the, the elements in the local quaternion algebra with trace zero, they form a ZP module of rank three. And these uh, sets VDN, uh, they sit inside uh, a global quaternion algebra. So, so they, 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 they lived inside uh, Z3. Okay. Uh, an artifact of the proof, it's not really necessary, but in order to simplify, uh, we can assume that this uh, DN, this suite of this uh, sequence of discriminants, uh, converges periodically to some uh, periodic number, some L, so, which is invertible. By taking a subsequence, we can always assume that. Uh, then when dn is close enough to L, they will differ by a square. So write dn as L times uh, the square of some uh, periodic number, an. So if we do that, uh, then use this an to uh, scale the set vdn. So you divide the elements in VDN by AN, and if you do that, then they will land inside this uh, periodic ball SL, yeah, because the norm will be uh, minus DN divided by AN squared, so that will be minus L. Uh, and uh, this is the key point, is that uh, this, uh, the elements to the left, they are like integral points, yeah, because they live in a global space, so this is our integral points. And this SL can be, can be thought as a periodic ball of radius L. Yeah. So uh, this uh, reminds of a linic problem. Yeah, so to understand the distribution of HDN intersect with DE, what we, what we have to do is to understand the distribution of these integer points, one over N VDN, inside the periodic ball S of SL. Yeah, so this is like the classical linear problem of uh, integral points inside uh, a real um, sphere. Now we are in a very similar situation. We have integral points for inside a periodic sphere. Well, the sphere is defined by the norm in the quaternion algebra. 
And okay, and we can solve this uh, linear problem. We can pr really prove that these sets um, one over a v d n are equidistributed according to the uniform measure on s of l. Yeah, remember the uniform measure that we discussed a few slides before. Uh, so just uh, well, I won't I won't go into the proof of this theorem, even though it's important for for our result. But uh, we follow um, uh, we we use uh, the classical bounds by Ivanik, Duke, and also a more recent refinement by Blomer uh, on Fourier coefficients of uh, half integral weight modular forms. In particular, uh, for this for this problem, we we, we need uh, we have to deal with a modular form of weight weight uh, three over two, and we need good bounds for the Fourier coefficients of that, and these bounds are available uh, thanks to these works. Okay, so now uh, the conclusion will be as follows. So. Uh, first of all, the fixed point formula tells you that uh, when you look at the fixed points of the elements of VDN, then you land exactly at the CM points inside this uh, disk DE. So uh, we deduce that the, if mu L is the uniform measure on, measure on SL, then the, the CM points uh, will be equidistributed according, according to the push forward measure. We, we can use the fixed point map to, um, to push the measure to the disk. And then one has to check, but that's really very formal, that uh, this uh, push forward measure does not really depend on this L, auxiliary L that we chose. Remember that we had this sequence of discriminants and we say, well, we can take a subsequence which converges. The point is that if you took another sequence that converts to another L, then uh, in the end, that doesn't matter. The, the measure is the same. Uh, the measure only depends on the maximal order you have. Uh, okay, so this will uh, disprove the equidistribution statement. So this by this, and then you, well, you put together on the information and you have a, a global equidistribution. Okay. Um, now, perhaps uh, I still have some time, so I will um, make some comments about this amplifying hypothesis. Yeah, because uh, I said they were not essential, uh, and they are not. Um, but um, I will give an idea or some idea of how you get rid of all these um, amplifying assumptions. So uh, the, the, um, the first uh, assumption was that this uh, local order O was uh, maximal order, which amounts to work with uh, fundamental discriminants. So in order to pass to the general case, uh, what we did was to use the Katz theory of the canonical group. Yeah, somehow, well, if, if you know this theory, um, then somehow when you start with a elliptic curve uh, with uh, such that the completion uh, of the endomorphism ring is certain quadratic order, if you apply the, uh, if you mod out by the canonical group, you get a new elliptic curve. And the order uh, has a, a P conductor, which is one less. So you, de you decrease the, the P conductor by applying the canonical group. So you can somehow use that uh, fact to uh, promote results for maximal orders to arbitrary orders by somehow applying uh, the inverse map attached to uh, modding out by the canonical group. Okay, so it's okay. It's it's not uh, entirely. It's not really so simple, but. Uh, it, uh, you have to do some theory, but this is how it works. So it's mainly due to Katz theory. Another assumption we, we did was that uh, P does not divide the discriminant. So that amounts to say that the, the order are unramified. 
when, when the order is ramified, um, what will change in the uniformization of the lambda O set is that the, the points inside SL that will have two fixed points. Um, so that, uh, so you have to work with two fixed points and somehow average over both. But you get an equidistribution statement anyway. There is also this uh, assumption P equals one mod four. Uh, when this assumption is not fulfilled, what happens is that um, the set lambda O is uh, split into two subsets, which are also compact. And uh, you can prove that um, uh, CM points of fundamental discriminants, they will, they will all land inside one of the components. And if you uh, modify the discriminant by, uh, by a conductor, which is a square mod P, then you will stay in this part. But if the conductor is not a square mod P, you will jump to the other part. So the conductors will somehow force you to move from one part to the other. So you will have one equidistribution statement for conductors which are a square mod P and another equidistribution statement for conductors which are not a square mod P. So it's a bit a mess of to write down, but uh, it, it's totally, it, it has the same structure as the theorem I already uh, explained. Yeah, and um, this hypothesis, uh, well, if you really use deformation theory, then you see it's not, it's not uh, difficult to get rid of this. Um, the deformation space is actually a covering of the E. It's not really the E, but a covering. So you work in the covering, you do all I, all I said, but in the covering. And at the very end, uh, you push the results of the covering to, to the disk. Okay, so that's how you get rid of this simplifying hypothesis. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, well, and I'm, 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 I'm reaching the, the end of the talk. So, um, so I will just comment that uh, we have current uh, ongoing work uh, to treat the same problem, but on more general Shimura varieties. That's joint work with uh, Yael Goen, uh, Sebastian Herrero, Paiman Casay, and Juan Rivera. Uh, and there's another di direction uh, that, uh, which is the joint equidistribution on products of periodic moderate curves for different primes. So uh, there was a talk by Philippe Michel in, in this seminar about, about this. Uh, and uh, well, this, this is joint work with uh, Meni Aka, Manuel Luetti, Philippe Michel, and Andreas Gieser. Okay, well, uh, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you.